Throughout the decades, there have been many different superstars who have left their long-lasting imprints on the league. With that being said, not every superstar player was so fortunate. Some players had their careers cut short before their legacy could truly get started. Today, I'm breaking down the top 10 ruined potentials of NBA history, according to me, of course. Let me make this clear. I'm not ranking this list based on how good the players were at the time their careers were cut short. But rather, I'm ranking these players based on how high I believe their potential was, compared to where their potential ended. So let's get into it. Starting off at number 10, Yao Ming. This graceful 7 foot 6 inch star looked as if he was poised to have a career that put him among the greatest centers in NBA history. Not only did he have the backing of an entire major country, but Yao was far more skilled and talented than his size would suggest as he had an incredibly soft touch and an elite mid-range game. He helped lead his Houston Rockets to the playoffs in two out of his first three seasons in the league, and was an all-star in each of those seasons. Unfortunately, it was in his fourth year in the league that he experienced his first major injury. From that point on, Yao's appearances on the court would be extremely inconsistent, as the health of his feet and knees completely betrayed him. His productivity on the court would continuously decline, and by the time he had reached his 31st birthday, he had played his final game in the NBA. Number 9. Tracy McGrady Based on the talent he displayed during his time in the league, you would think that T-Mac would be higher on my list. The thing is, he actually had a longer and healthier career than many players on this list. Considering how McGrady had already completed 8 seasons in the league before the injuries became a severe problem. With that being said, he was only 26 years old when the chronic back issues started to kick in. So there was still plenty of room for him to improve, and he's definitely worthy of being on this list. Before the injuries started, T-Mac had been a scoring champion in back-to-back -back seasons. He had been an all-star in 5 straight seasons and he was even being compared frequently to Kobe Bryant for the title of the best player in the NBA. It's hard to know what they could have achieved if he hadn't had his career derailed with injuries. But considering how his Rockets pushed the world champion Lakers to seven games in the 2009 playoffs, at least one championship for McGrady certainly isn't hard to envision. Number eight, David Thompson. He was the man known as Skywalker thanks to his remarkable athleticism, as he's constantly referred to as one of the greatest leapers of basketball history. To put it simply, this 6'4 shooting guard was one of the greatest scorers of all time, and in his first four years as a pro, he averaged about 26 points per game on a remarkable 51.4% shooting. One of the more special performances was when he scored 73 points against the Detroit Pistons, which included 53 points in the first half alone. David Thompson was one of the most skilled and athletic wings of basketball history, and even the great Michael Jordan drew much inspiration in his game from David Thompson, which is why he had Thompson present him into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, there was a lot of legacy building basketball left on the table for Thompson, Leading up to his first major injury, Thompson had been the Rookie of the Year, he had been an All-Star in his first four seasons, and he had even won the All-Star Game MVP twice. Shortly after his injury at the age of 25, it came to light that Thompson had a severe drug addiction, which only expedited the process of him exiting the NBA. Before he reached the age of 30, he had played his final game in the league. Number 7. Brandon Roy when he was at his best, Kobe Bryant referred to this 6'6 shooting guard as the most difficult player to guard in all of the Western Conference. He was one of the most clutch and gifted athletes in the game, as he was lethal from the perimeter and was a tremendous finisher around the rim. In his first three years in the league, he was the Rookie of the Year, he made multiple All-Star teams, and had established himself as one of the best closers in basketball. The thing is, we never got to see a truly healthy season from Brandon Roy, as the beginning of his injuries go all the way back to his rookie season. By his fourth year in the league, he had to undergo surgery on his knee, and before you know it, his career was in freefall, and he was out of the NBA by the age of 28. Number 6. Penny Hardaway 
During an interview in the mid-90s, Michael Jordan said that Penny Hardaway was one of the players who would carry on the torch after he retired. Penny was a large 6'7 point guard who had playmaking ability that was reminiscent of Magic Johnson, but he was also a perimeter shooter who was always a threat from deep. He was an electrifying all-star and a consistent triple-double threat. Defensively, he was also one of the best pickpockets in the entire league. After missing only five games in his first three seasons, he had to undergo knee surgery, which ended up affecting much of his explosiveness. From that point on, it was all downhill from there. Sure, he went on to have a long career, retiring from the game of basketball at the age of 36, but he was quickly reduced to that of a journeyman and a role player, never reliving the glory days of his first few seasons in the league. Number 5. Marie Stokes Stokes was a strong 6'7 power forward who was very ahead of his time, with his incredibly strong build and his tremendous athleticism. Maurice was an all-star and an all-NBA player in each of his first three seasons in the league. He was also one of the greatest rebounders of all time, as he led the league in rebounds in his rookie season with a whopping 16.3 per game. Similarly to Bill Russell, he wasn't the most skilled scorer, but he was an absolute force defensively and on the boards. He also had tremendous court vision for a power forward, as he was always among the league leaders in assists per game. He was a gifted young player who had the basketball world at his fingertips. Unfortunately, in his first ever playoff game in 1958, Stokes had one of the worst accidents in all of basketball, as he leaped over the top of the defender and landed on his head, which ended up paralyzing him for life. Jack Twyman, who was an NBA Hall of Famer and a former teammate of Stokes, said that if this accident never happened, he believed that the duo of Oscar Robertson and Marie Stokes would have made the Cincinnati Royals the dynasty of the 1960s, instead of the Boston Celtics. Number 4. Grant Hill Many NBA legends have referred to Grant Hill as the LeBron James before LeBron James, in the sense that he was a strong, quick, athletically gifted forward who could handle the ball like a dynamic guard. He was also a consistent triple-double threat, and after his first six seasons in the league, he had amassed these totals in points, assists, and rebounds. In the history of the NBA, only Oscar Robertson, Larry Bird, and LeBron James had eclipsed these numbers in their first six seasons in the league. Unfortunately for Hill, it was at the end of that sixth season, at the age of 26, where he severely sprained his ankle, which is the injury that would haunt him throughout his career. In later years, he did manage to reinvent himself as a solid contributing role player, with only a fraction of the explosiveness. But regardless, his talent and potential remains as one of the greatest what-ifs of NBA history. Number 3. Bill Walton Bill is an interesting case, because although he already built a championship Hall of Fame legacy in his short career, it still could have been so much more. In the history of the league, I don't believe there's ever been a more injury-prone player than Bill Walton, as the man was constantly fracturing bones all over his body. His injury history is enough to make even Anthony Davis blush, as he was always getting surgery for his broken legs and feet, starting as early as high school. Despite having a body made of glass, Walton was one of the most impressive centers on the court. In his first four seasons in the league, he was a rebounding champion, he was a blocks champion, he made two all-defense teams, he was a league MVP, he was an NBA champion, and he was the finals MVP. He was an elite passer for a big man, and he was one of the all-time great rebounders and rim protectors. Although he dragged his career out until his mid-30s, he was never able to play a prime season without injuries. One can only imagine the kind of resume this man would have built if he was never cursed with arguably the most frail body that the game has ever seen. Number 2. Derrick Rose at the time tragedy struck, Derrick Rose was younger than most of the players on this list. When he was with the Chicago Bulls, the 6'3 point guard was one of the most explosive players that the game had ever seen. His elite combination of speed, quickness, and leaping ability made him an absolute menace in fast break situations, and around the rim, he established himself as one of the all-time great finishers. 
After a monstrous season where he led the Bulls to a 62-20 record in 2011, he was rewarded with a league MVP at the age of 22, which made him the youngest MVP winner in the history of the NBA. Usually, superstar players win their first MVP award when they're around 8 to 10 years older, yet Rose was already in the mix of the best players in the league despite being one of the youngest players in the game. At this point, his potential seemed off the charts, as the Bulls appeared as if they were on their way to being perennial contenders. But in the first game of the 2012 playoff season, Derrick Rose tore his ACL, which forever hindered the explosiveness that he once had in his youth. Despite returning to the court, Rose would never be an MVP candidate again, and he never even returned to an NBA All-Star game for that matter. Number 1. Len Bias one of the greatest athletic potentials that the game has ever seen also turns out to be one of the most tragic stories of sports history. Len Bias was a 6 foot 8 inch forward out of the University of Maryland, who had a deep bag of skills. He was an athletic and strong force, and he had a smooth mid-range jumper, and was a tremendous rebounder. For a player who was only in his early 20s, Bias appeared as if he had already grown into his fully matured man body, which only led people to further imagine what kind of athlete he would be in his eventual prime. Bias wasn't just merely a great basketball player, but he was good enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Michael Jordan, as the two players regularly had epic battles in college. Not only did the stars appear to be great adversaries, but they looked as if they would one day have a great rivalry in the NBA. Thanks to a major trade several years earlier, the defending champion Boston Celtics had the second overall pick in the 1986 NBA Draft, and they used the pick to take the highly anticipated Len Bias, setting him up to learn under the wing of Larry Bird, while immediately competing for championships. Tragically, just hours after being drafted by the Celtics, Len Bias passed away due to drug use that caused him to have a fatal seizure. Again, there's no guarantee that he would have developed into a star at all, but based on his talent in college, based on his level of competition, and based on the situation he was heading into, I'm very comfortable putting him in the number one spot on my list. Basketball is a game defined by moments. With just one shot, a player's legacy can be redefined for decades to come. Throughout the years, the greats have hit plenty of clutch shots that have been ingrained into our memories. But what about the ones that were not as fortunate? Today, we're looking at some of the most significant single shots of league history and pondering what could have been if that shot had actually gone in. First, let me make this very clear. This is not a rankings list of the most significant shots, and this video doesn't contain all the great what-if shots either, just some of them. There's plenty more of these shots to address, so if you enjoy this video, let me know and I can make more of them in the future. So without further ado, let's get into it. Vince Carter in Game 7 of the 2001 Eastern Conference Semifinals this series was one of the great individual playoff battles of league history, as both Allen Iverson and Vince Carter were each in the prime of their careers. Several times, each star had exploded for at least 50 points during the series, and now the stars would clash for one last time in a seventh and deciding game in Philadelphia. Almost all of you know the result of this series, as Allen Iverson's 76ers famously made it to the NBA Finals and stole a game from the previously undefeated Los Angeles Lakers, which was sealed with his iconic jumper over Tyron Liu. In an instant, Iverson's most iconic moment was nearly wiped from history, as it was a one-point game with only two seconds left and Toronto was inbounding the ball. Vince got the ball, and after a great pump fake, he had a surprisingly clean look at the basket, but just missed. If Carter hits that shot, it sends the Raptors to the Eastern Conference Finals and completely changes both his and Allen Iverson's legacy. There's no guarantee that Toronto would have been able to get past a strong Milwaukee Bucks team in the Eastern Conference Finals, but if they did, there's a possibility that the roles would have been reversed, and the respect and adoration we have for Iverson's effort in the 01 Finals would have now gone to Carter, as he would have had his own shot against the Shaq and Kobe Lakers. Robert Ory in Game 5 of the 2003 Western Conference Semifinals. When it comes to Big Shot Bob, we've become so accustomed to seeing his highlights of him hitting the biggest shots when they mattered most. But unfortunately, this monumental shot is all you need to know that everyone has their highs and their lows. 
As we reflect on basketball history, we know that the San Antonio Spurs were the 2003 NBA champions. As Tim Duncan had his greatest playoff series of his career, and one of the greatest finals performances of league history. But one single shot had that all in serious jeopardy. It was in the West semifinals where the Lakers and Spurs were tied at two games apiece, and a battle of a pivotal fifth game in San Antonio. The Lakers weren't just defending their title, but they were attempting to win their fourth straight championship, while the Spurs were on the verge of winning their second and their first of the new decade. The Lakers had rallied from a major deficit, and Kobe had the ball with only 10 seconds left in the game, with all-time great defender Bruce Bowen all over him. When he kicked it to Ori, I thought for sure it was going in, and it was about as close as it possibly could have been, right as time was expiring. If Ori hits this shot, then the Lakers lead the series heading into Game 6. If they end up eliminating the Spurs, then there's a good chance they go all the way to the finals and defeat the New Jersey Nets, which is the same team they swept out of the previous finals. In the big picture, this would mean that Kobe would have six championship rings, equaling him to Michael Jordan's total, Tim Duncan would have only four, and Shaq and Kobe would have won four straight titles, which is a feat that not even Jordan and Pippen accomplished, but only Bill Russell's Celtics in the 1960s. To simply say that the shot had a significant impact on NBA history would be a massive understatement. Larry Bird in Game 4 of the 1987 NBA Finals it was the final matchup of the decade between the greatest rivals of NBA history, Magic Johnson's Lakers and Larry Bird's Celtics. Boston was in a must-win situation as they were down in the series two games to one. It was an exciting game throughout, and the final couple minutes had numerous lead changes. Magic hit one of the most iconic shots of finals history as he drilled the baby skyhook over the outstretched arm of Kevin McHale. The Lakers were now up by one point, but it was Larry Bird who would get the final opportunity to take the game. With the inbounds pass coming to him, Larry would have the chance to make the same shot he made just a couple plays earlier. But unfortunately for Boston, it was just a bit long, and the Lakers won the game, taking a commanding 3-1 lead. If Larry hit that shot, this series would have been tied at two games apiece, and assuming the rest of the series plays out the same way, Boston would have won Game 5, and the Lakers win Game 6, meaning there would have been a seventh and deciding game. In this scenario, if the Celtics go on to defeat the Lakers in seven games, then Larry Bird's final ring count would have been four, and Magic Johnson's final ring count would have been four as well, which honestly seems like a more fitting and poetic way for the equally great rivals to have ended their NBA careers. John Stockton in Game 6 of the 1998 NBA Finals Everyone knows about this series and about this sequence, as Michael Jordan hit the championship winning shot with 5.2 seconds remaining. The thing is, John Stockton was a great three-point shooter, and had just hit a clutch three-pointer just a few moments earlier. With Ron Harper defending him, Stockton got a decent look, and came up just short on what would have been the game-winning basket, which would have tied the series at three games apiece and forced a Game 7 in Utah. Now I know Jordan's stance will act like there's no possible way Jordan could have lost a Game 7 in the NBA Finals. And if that's you, then I don't blame you for being so convinced of that, but at least consider the circumstances for a minute. If John Stockton hits that shot and forces Game 7, then they would have been playing in Utah, where the Jazz had won three out of their four home games against the Bulls that season. Also consider that Scottie Pippen was dealing with major back problems throughout Game 6, so it's questionable whether or not he would have been available for Game 7. And even if he was, would he have had that much of a positive impact in his condition? Then you factor in that Jordan was 35 years old and was absolutely exhausted from carrying his team offensively in Game 6, as he scored 45 of his Bulls 87 points on 35 shot attempts. If push comes to shove, I may have bet on Michael Jordan in Game 7, but if Stockton makes that shot in Game 6, anything would have been possible. Patrick Ewing in Game 7 of the 1995 Eastern Conference Semifinals Maybe this isn't the most impactful shot from a big picture standpoint, but for Knicks fans who are old enough to witness it, this one still hurts to this day. Back then, Reggie Miller and his Indiana Pacers had a fierce and physical rivalry with Patrick Ewing's Knicks, as this was the third straight season that the two teams met up in the East playoffs. It's down to the final 30 seconds, and after a ridiculously clutch and difficult three by John Starks, Indiana's lead is cut down to just two points. Then after Mark Jackson's miss, the Knicks secure the rebound and have the opportunity to push the game to overtime. 
With five seconds left, New York inbounds the ball to their best player, Patrick Ewing. And after a spin move, he's met with very little resistance at the rim, but blows the biggest layup of his life. If Ewing made this layup, then his legacy changes forever, as this blown layup is the most memorable play that sums up his reputation as a choker. The Knicks also would have had the last laugh in one of the greatest rivalries of the 90s, and they would have gone on to face the talented Orlando Magic in the East Finals. Although it's unlikely that the Knicks would have gone on to defeat the Magic and then also the Rockets in the NBA Finals, regardless, it still has fans in the Big Apple asking themselves, what if? Let me take you back in time. It's the 06 to 07 NBA season. We're in the NBA playoffs and the Western Conference is just as competitive as ever before. The eighth seeded Warriors had just shockingly upset the first seeded Dallas Mavericks. The veteran-led San Antonio Spurs appeared poised for yet another deep postseason run, and the Phoenix Suns were looking as if they were finally ready to win their first championship in franchise history, as they were led by the recent back-to-back -back MVP winner. And unlike the previous season, the Suns were actually completely healthy in time for the playoffs. With the defending Western Conference champions now eliminated from the playoffs, everyone understood quite well that the two strongest teams remaining in the West were the San Antonio Spurs and the Phoenix Suns. At this point in history, the Western Conference was considered to be much stronger than the Eastern Conference. So the popular belief was that whoever won the matchup between the Spurs and Suns would be the eventual championship winner. As the second seed and the third seed, these two teams were meeting up in the 2007 West Semifinals. Leading up to this series, the last time we saw these two teams meet up in the playoffs was in 2005, where the Spurs eliminated the Suns out of the Conference Finals in just five games. Phoenix had grown much stronger since then though, as their defense had significantly improved, and they gained some much needed postseason experience. When the 07 series finally began, it was every bit as competitive as people were hoping it would be. After three games, San Antonio was up in the series two games to one, but Phoenix was leading game four heading into the final minutes. A game four victory for Phoenix would not only tie the series, but it would put them in a commanding position, as they would be taking back home court advantage with games five and seven being played in Phoenix. Now heading into the final moments of Game 4, the series had been a physical one so far. Steve Nash accidentally collided heads with Tony Parker, and gruesomely busted his nose. The nose would be re-aggravated several times throughout the series, and due to this, his superstar teammate Amari Stoudemire said that there was a high priority on protecting their MVP winning leader. So with that in mind, let's return to the final few minutes of Game 4. Phoenix is up by three points with only seconds left in the game, which means that San Antonio is in a must-foul situation. As Nash has the ball, he's sprinting into the front court, which is where Robert Ori meets him to deliver a strong hip check. With a necessarily rough contact and seemingly no play on the basketball whatsoever, this was quickly deemed as a flagrant foul on Robert Ori. Obviously, after seeing the 6'10 Robert Ory take a cheap shot on their 6'3 point guard, the Suns team had a very emotional and visceral reaction. Phoenix players like Rajah Bell, Sean Marion, and Leandro Barbosa were all physically involved in the commotion on the court. But even with that being the case, none of those players ended up being the central focus of the event. When you draw your attention to the Suns bench, you'll see a couple of players leave their seats and approach the commotion. Among those players was their superstar and their leading scorer, Amari Stoudemire, who was only on the bench in the first place because he had five personal fouls. Who also left the bench was their 6A power forward, Boris Diaw, who did a little bit of everything for the Suns and was certainly a key part of their rotation. So at this point, unless you're familiar with this historical event, you're probably wondering why Stoudemire and Diaw even matter in this situation. Well, it actually has to do with the NBA's sensitive mindset at that point in time. Before that series had taken place, just a few years earlier, the famous Malice of the Palace happened, which was a giant brawl involving the Pistons, Pacers, and the Detroit crowd. 
Without a doubt, this horrible event was one of the worst evenings in NBA history. And the league's commissioner at the time, David Stern, vowed to never let something like this ever happen again. As a result, the league immediately became much more strict, punishing players more quickly for technical fouls and doing everything they could to discourage players from escalating potentially dangerous situations. One of the measures that the NBA took was reinforcing the incredibly harsh consequences for any bench players who get involved in an altercation. In the NBA rulebook on rule number 12, section 7, letter C, it states that during an altercation, all players not participating in the game must remain in the immediate vicinity of their bench. Violators will be subject to suspension without pay for a minimum of one game and fined up to $50,000. This was the rule that they ultimately enforced on Amari Stoudemire and Boris Diaw, as they were both ultimately suspended for the crucial fifth game in Phoenix. These were the averages of Amari Stoudemire and Boris Diaw throughout the first four games, and this was the level of production that the Suns were now going to miss in Game 5. Despite being severely shorthanded, Phoenix still challenged the Spurs in Game 5, ultimately losing the game by just three points. And as expected, with now home court advantage and morale on their side, San Antonio closed out the series in the sixth game. If the suspensions never took place, then Phoenix likely wins game five. And with game seven eventually being played in their building, it's hard to envision the Suns losing that series at full strength. I'm not even a Phoenix Suns fan, but as a basketball fan, this decision to severely punish the Suns in this extremely important series was tremendously frustrating for several reasons. For one, the NBA clearly made this decision in light of their paranoia from the malice at the palace. And if this had occurred on most other years, severe punishments likely wouldn't have been ensued. It was also frustrating because the NBA has been extremely inconsistent throughout the years about enforcing this rule. And there have been many other instances before and since where players came off the bench to get involved and were not suspended. So to all of a sudden take extreme measures in a pivotal playoff series that ultimately decided the championship seems like a gross misuse of power. And maybe the biggest reason why it's frustrating is because they essentially rewarded Robert Ory for committing the cheap shot. If Ori did it on purpose just to entice the Phoenix players to leave their bench to support their teammate, then it was a ruthlessly brilliant decision, regardless of it being morally reprehensible. Again, the winner of this series was going to be on cruise control for the NBA championship. Before the playoffs began, people initially believed it was going to be the Dallas Mavericks in the Western Conference Finals, but instead it was the fourth-seeded Utah Jazz who the San Antonio Spurs dealt with quickly in just five games. And then, in the NBA Finals, they easily swept the overachieving and the inexperienced Cleveland Cavaliers. Likely because of this decision to suspend Stoudemire and Diaw, the Phoenix Suns organization still doesn't have an NBA championship banner to this very day. And a former two-time MVP winner like Steve Nash is frequently criticized for simply having statistics that didn't lead to winning, when in reality, he was stripped of his legitimate opportunity to win. Honestly, it still blows my mind that the players who were most severely punished for the event were guys who were literally not involved in the original altercation. For goodness sake, Raja Bell put his hands on Ori and shoved him, and he was not suspended, but yet Stoudemire and Diaw, who simply stepped forward a few feet, were disqualified from Game 5. In the end, we can only imagine just how much this truly changed history in the grand scheme of things. With the title, Nash is likely considered as one of the select few greatest point guards of all time. Without a ring in 2007, Tim Duncan's legacy and reputation certainly takes a hit, and even a head coach like Mike D'Antoni is probably viewed in a much more positive light by the basketball community with a ring on his finger. So what do you guys think? Was the punishment fit for the offense, or was the NBA overreacting in this scenario? 
Also, if this is not it, what do you think was the worst decision that the NBA has ever made? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. Number 10. Clay Thompson to the Timberwolves In 2014, the Warriors were seen as just short of being contenders, and Clay Thompson and Steph Curry were just on the verge of establishing themselves as superstars within the league. At this point, Kevin Love was already seen as a legit star for Minnesota, but the relationship between Love and the Wolves had grown cold. Negotiations were ongoing, but among the trade offers from Golden State included players like Draymond Green, Harrison Barnes, David Lee, and of course, Clay Thompson. Jerry West was a consultant for the Warriors at the time, and he threatened to resign from the Warriors staff if the team decided to trade Thompson. At the time, most Warriors fans would have desired Kevin Love over Thompson, but after West's ultimatum, the Warriors decided to hold on to their sharpshooting talent, and the rest is history. Number 9. Chris Paul to the Lakers Of all the near trades on this list, this one was the closest to actually materializing, as for about a 45 minute window, it seemed as if it was a foregone conclusion. The Lakers would have given up both Pau Gasol and Lamar Odom, but the pairing of Paul and Bryant would have certainly made them contenders in the Western Conference. Los Angeles also had Andrew Bynum on the roster before he was inevitably traded for Dwight Howard one year later. Whether it was a trio involving Bynum or Howard, it would have been tough for Los Angeles to have got by the San Antonio Spurs or the Miami Heat, but they at least would have had a chance. Due to the recent resurgence of super teams, small market owners were furious at the Lakers' acquisition of Paul and demanded that the commissioner David Stern block the trade. Stern did just that, and later released a statement saying it was for quote, basketball reasons. In the end, this is only now remembered as one of the most frustrating days of Lakers history. Number 8. Scottie Pippen to the Supersonics If you've seen The Last Dance, then you'll remember Scottie Pippen having an icy relationship with the Bulls general manager, Jerry Krause. Due to this, Pippen was constantly among trade discussions, and one of the times he was, was in the summer of 1994. It was shortly after Michael Jordan's first retirement, and the Bulls management was considering a full rebuild. At the time, the player in consideration was the Seattle Supersonics dynamic power forward, Sean Kemp. Later on, Kemp would have made for an interesting running mate for Jordan in Chicago, while the tandem of Scottie Pippen and Gary Payton would have made for one of the greatest perimeter defenses that the game has ever seen. Fortunately for Chicago fans, the Bulls ultimately decided not to deal their star small forward as Pippen went on to win his fourth, fifth, and sixth championship with Chicago. Number 7. Kevin Garnett to the Lakers Ultimately, the trade partner ended up being Boston, where KG went on to win his lone championship and the league's defensive player of the year. But before that, one of the near destination landings for the big ticket was in Los Angeles. Garnett had always been vocal about his desire to play with Kobe Bryant, and it nearly happened as the Lakers were offering a trade package that included both Andrew Bynum and Lamar Odom. In this case, it was the Timberwolves who decided against it, as they held out for a better deal, which in their mind ended up being the Celtics offer in the summer of 2007. Would Garnett and Kobe have won championships together? With KG on the roster, it's unlikely that they ever make the Kwame Brown trade for Pau Gasol, so it's debatable whether or not that would have been a better thing for the Lakers in the long run, but at the very least, it makes for one intriguing what-if scenario. Number 6. Tracy McGrady to the 76ers T-Mac's early years were famously spent with his fellow star, Vince Carter. The thing is, McGrady hadn't quite yet developed into the superstar that he would become in Orlando, so around the turn of the millennium, Toronto was prematurely evaluating their trade options. Before eventually settling on Orlando, McGrady was strongly being pursued by the Philadelphia 76ers. The main piece being offered was the shooting guard, Larry Hughes. If the trade had materialized, it would have created a superstar tandem of Tracy McGrady and Allen Iverson, each as they were entering the prime of their careers. The two stars would have almost certainly dominated the Eastern Conference, considering how relatively weak the conference was in the early 2000s. Number 5. Charles Barkley to the Lakers Turns out that a lot of the great what-if trades of basketball history involve the purple and gold, and in this case, it was for the all-time great power forward, Charles Barkley. In 1992, the relationship between Barkley and the 76ers had soured, and although they eventually dealt Sir Charles to the Phoenix Suns, before that, he was nearly dealt to the Lakers. Reportedly, the package was Barkley and Ron Anderson for James Worthy and Eldon Campbell. 
It would have been just after Magic Johnson retired, but it also would have been just a few years before Shaq and Kobe were acquired. So it's no guarantee that the Lakers would have been contenders in the West. But at the very least, Charles was the league MVP the following season when he played in Phoenix. So he would have made them a viable threat until Shaquille O'Neal signed later on. Number 4. Steph Curry to the Milwaukee Bucks In 2012, Steph Curry hadn't quite developed yet into the MVP superstar who would transform the league. In fact, he could barely stay on the court, as he was struggling through numerous ankle injuries. At the time, the Warriors were interested in acquiring the center, Andrew Bogut from Milwaukee, and they did eventually get him in a trade, but one of the initial trade packages would have been involving Steph Curry. Obviously, a move like this would have had a tremendous effect on basketball history as we know it, as in this scenario, the Warriors franchise never becomes a dynasty. It's a large assumption to think that the Bucks would have simply drafted Giannis just a couple years later, when Curry almost certainly would have affected the draft position of the team. With that being said, considering how Milwaukee liked Giannis and picked him later in the first round, there's still a decent possibility that the tandem would have formulated. Number 3. Dirk Nowitzki and Steve Nash to the Raptors Both were nearly traded together from the Dallas Mavericks to the Toronto Raptors. Both Dirk and Nash still had some things to prove as individual superstars, while Toronto's Vince Carter was at the height of his powers. The proposed trade was Dirk and Nash for Vince Carter and Antonio Davis. In hindsight, this is an obviously lopsided trade in favor of Toronto, but it didn't quite appear that way at the time, which is why Toronto's general manager was the one who ultimately declined the trade, opting to keep his superstar, Vince Carter. Over the next several years, Dirk and Nash combined would each win numerous MVPs and an NBA championship, which left the Raptors organization feeling like they committed one of the more regrettable decisions of NBA history. Number 2. Kobe Bryant to the Chicago Bulls In the summer of 2007, after back-to-back -back first round exits to the Phoenix Suns, Kobe was extremely frustrated with the state of the Lakers, which is understandable since they had starters like Smush Parker, Luke Walton, and Kwame Brown. With a lack of a contender, which was promised to him when he signed a few years earlier, Kobe publicly demanded a trade elsewhere. Since Kobe had a no-trade clause, he gave the Lakers management a short list of teams that he was willing to go to, and among those teams was the Chicago Bulls. Reportedly, the Lakers and the Bulls had agreed to a deal, which would have sent Tyrus Thomas, Ben Gordon, Joakim Noah, and Luol Deng to Los Angeles for Kobe Bryant. But the Mamba ended up blocking the deal. The thing is, Kobe didn't want to go to a Chicago team that was devoid of talent, and in Kobe's own words, it would have been like going from one bad situation to another. Kobe said the only way he would approve a deal to Chicago is if Lou Aldang was still there to play with him. Under these restrictions, the two teams were never able to make an agreement. Obviously, as a Lakers fan, I'm glad Kobe had a 20-year career with the Lakers, but it would have been at least interesting to see his career unfold in Chicago. He would have been playing in the shadow of the great Michael Jordan, and it would have been interesting to see if he could fill those shoes. It also would have put him in the same conference as LeBron James, where they would have inevitably had numerous battles in the NBA playoffs. Number 1. Michael Jordan and Clyde Drexler to the Houston Rockets In my opinion, this is the greatest what-if trade of NBA history, and frankly, it's not even close. So let me first paint the picture. It's draft day, 1984, and the Rockets have the first overall pick in the draft, followed by the Blazers with the second pick, and the Bulls with the third pick. Obviously, in reality, we know how the draft went down. Hakeem Olajuwon was taken first by the Houston Rockets, Sam Bowie was taken second by the Blazers, which was a mistake to say the least, and Michael Jordan was taken third by Chicago. The thing is, there was a pre-selection trade in place which would have landed Michael Jordan, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Clyde Drexler all as teammates on the Houston Rockets. So essentially, the Rockets already had Hakeem Olajuwon and the Hall of Famer Ralph Sampson on the roster. Both were superstar big men who were each capable of playing the center position. Due to this, some saw Houston's Ralph Sampson as an expendable asset. Portland was interested in acquiring their own star big man in an era that was dominated by players at the center position. So an offer was in place that would have sent the second overall pick and Clyde Drexler to the Houston Rockets for Ralph Sampson. Hakeem Olajuwon talked about this proposed offer in his book called Living the Dream, and he said that if the deal had gone through, the Rockets would have taken Hakeem with the first pick, 
Michael Jordan with the second pick, and obviously, they would have had Clyde Drexler as well. Theoretically, this would have formed the scariest big three on paper that the league has ever seen. Believe it or not, it was actually Houston who declined the offer, and decided to stick with their twin tower tandem of Hakeem and Sampson. It's not like Houston ended up being total failures for declining this offer, considering how they still went on to win multiple championships with Hakeem. But hypothetically, if they had Hakeem, Jordan, and Drexler all since 1984, how many championships could they have won? 8? 10? 12? Let me know your estimation. If you've followed my channel for a while, maybe you've noticed that I tend to go on imagination overload, as I continuously ask myself what could have happened if these situations played out differently. Today, I'm looking at this question through the lens of some of the greatest performances of NBA history, specifically the all-time great performances that were cut short for one reason or another. What if those players remained in the game until the final buzzer sounded? What kind of records would we be looking at today, and how would it change our perceptions of those legends? Today, I'll do my best to answer that as we marvel at what was and what could have been. The majority of this video is dominated by two players specifically, and the first of those is Kobe Bryant. Kobe was known to heat up quickly as an offensive player, and although that attribute translated to many historic evenings, several of those never even saw a fourth quarter. Kobe had five games in his career where he scored over 50 points through the first three quarters, and in only one of those games did he actually play in the fourth quarter, and unsurprisingly, that happened to be the night he scored 81 points. The first time he did that was on January 14, 2002, against the Memphis Grizzlies. Shaq had been suspended for several games for basically trying to end Brad Miller on the spot. Fortunately, Shaq is more accurate with his free throws than his punches. Without the big fella available down low, Kobe took it upon himself to carry the Lakers offensively, and that's exactly what he did, as the Mamba was blazing throughout, dropping 56 points, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists on 61.8% shooting. The Lakers were up by 39 points at the end of the third quarter, so he sat out the entirety of the fourth. Considering how Kobe had 53 points through three quarters of the 81 game, at the very least, he had a chance of reaching 80 points on this evening as well. The second instance was February 12, 2003 against the Denver Nuggets. Once again, Shaq was not available during the stretch, so Kobe had to lead the Lakers offensively. This was actually the third game of Kobe's famous streak of nine straight 40-point games, and this was probably the most impressive. Through three quarters of play, Kobe had amassed a total of 51 points, three rebounds, two assists, and two steals on 53.6% shooting. Due to this one-man onslaught, his Lakers were up by 33 points at the end of the third quarter, and once again, Kobe didn't play a second of the fourth quarter. The third instance was on December 20th, 2005 against the Dallas Mavericks. You all know about this game, so I won't talk about it too long. But this was Kobe's famous 62 points in only three quarters, which is arguably the most impressive scoring performance of all time. It was nine points more than what Kobe had through three quarters in the 81-point game. If Kobe had a fourth quarter just like the third quarter of this game, or like the fourth quarter of the Raptors game, then he would have finished with 90 or 92 points. Honestly, I don't even think that's the craziest thing he passed up by sitting out the fourth quarter. At the end of the third, the scoreboard read the Mavericks 61, Kobe 62. In the history of the league, no single player has ever finished with more points than the opposing team, and Kobe had a very realistic shot of achieving it on this evening. Keep in mind that he nearly did this against a Mavericks team that was in the better half of the league defensively, and went on to the NBA Finals that season. Instead, Kobe settled with a mere total of 62 points, 8 rebounds, and 3 steals on 58.1% shooting. The last instance that Kobe did this was on November 30th, 2006 against the Utah Jazz. It didn't matter that the Mamba was being guarded by the defensively elite Andre Kirilenko, as he had one of the most efficient scoring explosions of his career. At one stretch, he hit 11 straight shots without a miss, en route to a third quarter stat line of 52 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 assists on 73.1% shooting. 
With the Lakers up by 22 points at the end of the third quarter, the Mamba comfortably rested the remainder of the evening. If the Mamba had played in the fourth quarter of each of these games, then we're looking at a resume today of a handful of 70-point games, several 80-point games, and possibly even a 90-point performance. If anyone ever bothers to call Kobe a stat patter, gently remind them of all the stats that the Mamba passed up. On December 5th, 2016, against the Indiana Pacers, Clay had his own three-quarter eruption. Many people describe Thompson as the ultimate catch-and-shoot type of player, and no game sums that up better than this one. He didn't need to play in the fourth quarter. In fact, he only played 29 minutes of the game, and in that time, he dropped 60 points on 63.6% .6 shooting. He did all of this on only 11 dribbles in the game, which speaks to his talent and his unique skill set. Clay is one of only two players to score at least 50 points in less than 30 minutes of playing time. The other player we'll get to later in the video. Thanks to this dominant display, his Warriors were up by 33 points at the end of the third, which is why he didn't see a second of the fourth. Another Clay onslaught was cut short on January 23rd, 2015 against the Sacramento Kings. This is where Thompson famously set the record for the most points ever scored in a single quarter when he dropped 37. He finished the game with 52 points, 5 assists, 2 rebounds, 4 steals, and 2 blocks on 64% shooting. In that iconic quarter, he made up 37 of the Warriors' 41 points. His third quarter was literally perfect, as he went 13 of 13 from the field, 9 of 9 from 3-point range, and 2 of 2 from the free throw line. The thing is, because of the blowout, he only played in 2 minutes and 32 seconds of the fourth quarter. Not only was he sitting on 52 with a significant amount of game left, but he had also made 11 threes at that point. If he had remained in the game, he could have possibly got the NBA record for the most three-pointers made in a single game. Speaking of which, the last Klay Thompson game was on October 29th, 2018, and what I believe is his most interesting what-if on this list. It was against the lowly Chicago Bulls, who had no answer for his sniping throughout. On this evening, Klay set the NBA record for the most three-pointers made in a single game, with a total of 14. But what's absurd is that he set this record with 4 minutes and 53 seconds left in the third quarter. Not only did Clay not play in the fourth, but he didn't play in the final 16 minutes of the game. Not only could Clay have added to his impressive totals of 52 points, 4 rebounds, and 2 steals, but he also could have amassed a total of 3 pointers that may have never been challenged for as long as we live. On November 30th, 2019, James Harden exploded for one of his highest scoring contests against the Atlanta Hawks. This was during the peak of Harden's prime as a scorer, as the lowly Hawks had no answers for him anywhere on the court, as he dropped 60 points, 8 assists, 3 rebounds, and 3 steals on 66.7% shooting. I'm sure there's a part of Harden that wanted to play, as reaching the 80-point threshold would obviously do a tremendous amount for his legacy. But if he had continued to play, it would have been the most unnecessary fourth quarter on this list, as the Rockets were leading the Hawks by as many as 50 points in the third quarter. On February 9, 2019, Damian Lillard had a career night, lighting up the Sacramento Kings in only three quarters. He's yet another player who becomes extremely dangerous as he warms up from the perimeter, and the Kings learn that the hard way, as he poured in 50 points, 6 assists, and 3 steals on 61.5% shooting, including 8 three-pointers. He did that incredible stat line in only 29 minutes of play, which put him right beside Klay Thompson as the only players to ever reach 50 points in less than 30 minutes of game time. The Blazers had an 18-point lead at the end of the third, and the reserves held strong, allowing Lillard to spend the entirety of the fourth quarter on the bench. For this next one, we're going way back in time. On April 9, 1978, the Iceman, George Gervin, put on a show for the ages. This evening in the NBA was actually pretty fascinating, as it was the last night of the regular season, and the Celtics legend John Havlicek was playing his final game, which drew all of the media's attention. Unfortunately, that meant that the scoring race and the performances of David Thompson and George Gervin were not caught on film. David Thompson dropped 73 points to take the lead of the league scoring crown ahead of Gervin. George would then need to score 49 points against the New Orleans Jazz to take the scoring crown back from Thompson, and he was well aware of this. 
Well, Gervin scored 53 points in the first half. With their playoff seating already locked in place, Gervin stayed in the game just long enough to pass David Thompson, as he finished with 63 points, 2 rebounds, and 2 steals on 46.9% shooting. His Spurs were blown out 153 to 132, but it was never about that as San Antonio was content to rest their stars for the playoffs. Gervin didn't play in the fourth quarter and played only a total of 33 minutes. At the very least, an 80-point performance was in the realm of possibility if George really wanted it. The last performance on this list has a different spin to it. It came from Larry Bird on February 18, 1985 against the Utah Jazz. During his prime, Larry was known for filling up the stat sheet, but one game summed that up better than any other. In a blowout victory, Larry Legend put up a total of 30 points, 12 rebounds, 10 assists, and 9 steals on 59.1% shooting. The thing is, Larry didn't even play in the fourth quarter. Even crazier than that, he only played 33 minutes. Only four players in NBA history have ever achieved the illustrious quadruple double, but none of those players did it in three quarters. At that point in history, only one player had achieved the quadruple double. Not only could he have easily been only the second player to do it if he had simply played in the fourth quarter, but he had also tied the NBA record for the most steals in a game with nine. Just one more steal would have secured the record as his own, but Larry truly only cared about winning, so he passed that up too. So now it's your turn. I've got two questions for you guys. One, which one of these performances was the most impressive? And two, if you could see only one of these performances played out till the final buzzer, which game would it be? Let me know in the comments section below. When we talk about the legend that is Wilt Chamberlain, a lot of divisive topics tend to come up, and one of the most notable ones is how he played an insane amount of minutes. Most famously, was his 48.5 minutes per game average in 1962. That's more minutes than there are in a regulation game. This was possible because of the overtime games that he played that season. Other than an instance where he had been ejected by the referee, he played every single minute of the 1961-62 season. I feel like I have an objective view on this topic. For one, obviously Wilt is going to have a statistical advantage by playing the entirety of basketball games. Maybe not in terms of efficiency, but certainly in terms of totals and averages. On the other hand, I do think it's worth giving Wilt credit for having the stamina and conditioning to last all 48 minutes, because if every star could do it while remaining extremely effective, then every superstar would. So hypothetically, what if the greatest players of all time played all 48 minutes just like Wilt Chamberlain did? Assuming they had the stamina to endure that, what kind of numbers and achievements would have been possible? Well, let's dig into it, starting by looking at some of the best seasons of my other 8 GOAT candidates if they played all 48. Let's start with the face of Showtime, Magic Johnson. One of his best individual seasons was his MVP campaign in 1989, and under 48 minutes, that translates to a remarkable 28.8 points, 16.4 assists, and 10.1 rebounds on 50.9% shooting. Again, under the stress of the extra load of minutes, maybe his efficiency would suffer a bit, but at the very least, this is his per 48 minutes numbers. How about Larry Bird? One of his best seasons was in 1988, which translates to 36.8 points, 11.4 rebounds, and 7.6 assists on 50-40-90 percentages. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was a beast in 1971, and his numbers are 37.9 points, 19 rebounds, and 4 assists on 57.7% shooting. Tim Duncan had his historic run in 2003, and he's averaging north of 28 points, nearly 16 rebounds, and 5 assists on 51.3% shooting. How about Kobe's revered 05-06 season? In this scenario, he's putting up over 41 points, 6 rebounds, and 5 assists on 45% shooting. The ultimate winner, Bill Russell, had a legendary start to his career in 1958, which is now nearly 21 points, 28.4 rebounds, which is higher than anything Wilt Chamberlain ever did, and 3.7 assists on 44.2% shooting. LeBron James's best year is arguably his 2012-13 MVP campaign, where his Heat won 33 straight games, and now his numbers are 34 points, 10 rebounds, and 9 assists on 56.5% shooting. Michael Jordan has a few seasons to choose from, 
but arguably, his statistical best was in 1987, which is now 44.5 points, 6.3 rebounds, and 5.5 assists on 48.2% shooting. This is the list of my GOAT candidates. Which of their individual seasons stand out the most? The funny thing is, although these are the players that are most often seen as the greatest, there is arguably much stronger stat lines, especially in recent years. Luka Doncic, in only his second season, had a per 48 stat line of 41 points, 13 rebounds, and 12 assists on 46.3% shooting. That makes Oscar Robertson's triple-double season look cute by comparison. Another example is James Harden's 18-19 season with the Rockets, which was a stat line of an insane 47.2 points, 9.8 assists, and 8.7 rebounds on 47.2% shooting. And finally, Giannis' historic 2020 season, with 46 points, 21 rebounds, and 9 assists on 55.3% shooting. When you look at this per 48 minute stat line from Giannis, we begin to understand how the numbers Wilt Chamberlain put up in his prime were actually possible. What's interesting is that even if you prorate every season to 48 minutes, Wilt Chamberlain's 1962 season still is the highest scoring season of NBA history. What's also interesting is how four out of the top six spots all happen to be within the last four seasons. As far as rebounds, Bill Russell now takes the top spot. Between Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain, they own the top 17 seasons of NBA history. The top 25 spots are all owned by players from the 1960s, which really tells you how inflated the rebounding numbers were during that era. Concerning assists per game, John Stockton owns the top four spots, with some truly absurd numbers. Based on this metric, he's putting up a 2020 game with assists nearly every night. These are the top seasons in steals per game, with the extremely underrated Alvin Robertson taking three out of the top five spots on the list. I'm definitely much overdue on making his own solo video. For blocks per game, the top four spots of the list are owned by the 7 foot 7 inch Manute Bull and the 7 foot 4 inch Mark Eaton, with blocks averages that seemed only possible if your name was Wilt Chamberlain. But as you can see, some video game numbers actually become attainable when the great players play all 48 minutes. Much of what this video confirms is what I already suspected. A lot of what Wilt Chamberlain accomplished isn't actually as ridiculous as it initially sounded. But the reason why we rarely see players put up numbers like he did is because they never give themselves the opportunity to in the first place because they have limited minutes. Although Wilt Chamberlain is the only player to average 48 minutes per game, this minutes inflation advantage isn't pertaining to him alone. Most superstars of his era were given a workload that would be seen as preposterous by today's standards. In the current NBA, not a single player averages at least 39 minutes per game. 60 years ago, seven superstar players averaged north of 40 minutes per game. And keep in mind, that was at a time when the NBA had less than one third of the players that it has in the league today. My takeaway from this video is that there is obviously an advantage to playing all 48 minutes. But with that being said, there's a reason why only one player has ever done it before. And maybe the fact that Will Chamberlain was a fantastic track athlete is part of the reason why he was able to manage such a heavy workload. It's hard to say for sure. So now it's your turn. If there was any player other than Will Chamberlain who was asked to play all 48 minutes, which superstar do you think would have handled that the best? Let me know in the comment section below. Also, shout out to Randall for suggesting this video. Hope you enjoyed it. As most basketball fans already know, Tracy McGrady was simply one of the most talented players to ever play the game. As Kobe Bryant once described him, he was a player who had all the skills and athleticism, but in a 6'9 frame. At his peak, he was averaging as high as 32 points per game, and he's famously known for his iconic comeback over the San Antonio Spurs, where he scored 13 points in only 35 seconds. As talented as McGrady was, his potential reached even higher. But unfortunately, his chronic back injuries disrupted his career and stunted his progression, making him one of the greatest what-ifs of basketball history. With that being said, we still got to witness McGrady perform at an elite level for roughly seven seasons straight, and within that window, many stories and legacy-defining moments took place that much of the basketball community have since forgotten.
Today, we're tackling the story of Tracy McGrady's career and evaluating the events that took place when his legacy was on the line. When McGrady entered the league, he was an 18-year-old kid straight out of high school who would take time to blossom into the superstar we know. T-Mac was only operating as a role player in his time in Toronto, while his cousin Vince Carter was operating as the franchise player and the talk of the town. In his last season as a member of the Raptors, McGrady made the NBA playoffs but was swept out of the first round in three games by the New York Knicks. Unfortunately, this early playoff exit would begin to become a theme of his career, a theme that would start to build a narrative about him as a player and about his legacy. In the summer of 2000, McGrady signed with the Orlando Magic, putting him in a position where he was now able to shine as the primary superstar of a team. McGrady was now averaging around 27 points per game and was proving himself to be one of the best perimeter players in the entire league. Orlando finished as a 7th seed heading into the playoffs, where they were matched up with a far more talented Milwaukee Bucks squad. It's also worth mentioning that Tracy's sidekick Grant Hill was out for the playoffs with yet another significant injury, which meant that T-Mac had to carry the team almost exclusively offensively. He put up ridiculously monstrous all-around numbers throughout the series, but ultimately it wasn't anywhere close to enough as the stacked Bucks closed out the Magic in four games. The following season was more of the same, as Grant Hill once again missed the entirety of the playoffs, while Tracy had to carry an Orlando squad that was pretty devoid of talent. This time, the Magic were eliminated in four games by the Charlotte Hornets, and McGrady once again put up insanely monstrous numbers. He consistently wasn't getting the help he needed, and as a result, this ended up being the third straight season that T-Mac had been eliminated out of the first round of the playoffs. But it was in the next season where his reputation started to take some major hits. From an individual standpoint, McGrady's 02-03 season was likely the best of his career, as he put up his best regular season numbers yet. The thing is, Tracy was still missing a second star, as Grant Hill only played 29 games, which were all in the first half of the season. Orlando finished with a 42-40 record, which was good enough for only the 8th seed in the Eastern Conference, and resulted in a matchup with the consistently contending Detroit Pistons. McGrady and the Magic were obviously massive underdogs in this series, and stunningly, they roared out of the gates and managed to get a 3-1 series lead over Detroit. Up to this point, Tracy looked like he was having one of the greatest playoff series in NBA history as he dominated his way to these absurdly high and efficient numbers against arguably the best defensive team of that era. Unfortunately, the season wasn't yet over at that point, but that didn't stop McGrady from acting like it. In a controversial post-game interview, McGrady confidently stated, it feels good to get into the second round, even though his magic were only up three games to one. It was a classic example of pride coming before the fall, as the Pistons went on to crush the Magic in the next three games straight, winning by an average of 20.3 points. The series was a tale of two McGrady's, as his last three games looked nothing like his first four, as he was contained to extremely inefficient numbers by Detroit. Not only did McGrady's post-game comment age like milk, but it also started to appear like some self-induced curse, as he once again failed to get out of the first round, and the narrative was now firmly established that he was a superstar that just couldn't advance in the playoffs. What's probably worse than getting eliminated in the first round is not making the playoffs at all, which is what happened in the 03-04 season, as Orlando finished with the worst record in the Eastern Conference, despite McGrady winning his second straight scoring title. At this point, Orlando's management had finally accepted the fact that they were a franchise that needed a rebuild, and traded McGrady to the Houston Rockets. T-Mac expressed his excitement to play with the new star big man, Yao Ming. As a legitimate superstar duo, McGrady and Yao led the Rockets to a 51-31 record, and it appeared that McGrady might finally be in a solid position to advance beyond the first round. They were facing a solid Dallas Mavericks team whose Dirk Nowitzki was just reaching the prime of his career. T-Mac started off solid, as did his Rockets, as they stormed out to a 2-0 lead in the series. The Mavericks clawed their way back into it and the series was heading to a deciding 7th game in Dallas. Although T-Mac had played incredible throughout the majority of the series and had put up his usual strong postseason numbers, he picked the wrong time and place to come out cold, as Tracy missed his first 7 shots of the 7th game. 
Houston can never find their groove, and the Mavericks completely demolished McGrady and the Rockets, winning the deciding game by a whopping 40 points. At this point in history, many basketball fans, including myself, were confused as to what to make of Tracy McGrady. On one hand, he appeared to be one of the greatest talents that the game of basketball had ever seen, and consistently produced tremendous postseason numbers. But on the other hand, for one reason or another, he just couldn't get past the first round of the playoffs, as he was now 0-5 in his first round appearances. In the following season, Houston was hit with a slew of injuries, including the first major one to Tracy McGrady, as it was the beginning of his devastating back injuries that would ultimately cut his career short. Due to this, the 05-06 Rockets missed the playoffs entirely, finishing with only a 34-48 record. The Rockets franchise was able to bounce back in the 06-07 season, as Yao Ming had a breakout year, asserting himself as Houston's number one scoring option. T-Mac was still a legitimate weapon, but with his back issues still lingering, he saw a significant drop in his regular season production. With that being said, together, Yao and McGrady led the Rockets to a 52-30 record, good enough for the fifth seed in the West playoffs. Prior to the start of their first round series with Utah, McGrady was being interviewed by ESPN's own Stephen A. Smith. And in the interview, Stephen A. didn't waste any time acknowledging the elephant in the room, T-Mac's inability to lead his team past the first round up until this point. A confident yet agitated McGrady responded with this. It's on me. If we don't get out of the first round, it's on me. Wait a minute. If we don't get out of the first round this year, it's on me. It's pretty incredible to see such a bold statement from a superstar like McGrady. It's not often that athletes bet on themselves with such ownership and such a sense of responsibility. The pressure was immense, and almost everyone in the basketball world was waiting to see how it unfolded. Through the first six games, McGrady was getting his numbers, but he was doing it at a high volume of shots, as he wasn't shooting the ball very efficiently at all. Fortunately, he was actually getting help from a solid supporting cast, and as a result, the series was tied at three games apiece, heading into the seventh and deciding game. The pressure for him had never been more intense than it was in this game, and under these extreme circumstances, McGrady produced, finishing Game 7 with 29 points, 13 assists, 5 rebounds, and 3 blocks on 48% shooting. Unfortunately, it still wasn't enough, as Utah Stars had individual performances for the ages. After this close defeat, McGrady had been eliminated from the first round in all 6 appearances of his career. A clearly emotional McGrady was trying hard to keep his composure in the press conference afterwards. But as soon as the questions started to come, T-Mac simply left without answering the question, saying emotionally, This was beyond devastating. Not only was it yet another first round defeat, but McGrady's team had a two game series lead in 2003, 2005, and 2007 and went on to lose each and every series. The following year, Houston would get a rematch with the Utah Jazz in the first round of the playoffs. But tragically, Yao Ming's season was shut down two months before the playoffs began due to a stress fracture in his left foot. This meant that a shorthanded McGrady had to do his best to carry the offense for the Rockets. But ultimately, despite a pretty solid series performance, McGrady was eliminated for the seventh time from the first round, as the Jazz comfortably closed it out in six games. From this point on, Tracy's career wouldn't be about his early playoff exits, but rather about his early regular season exits due to his severe back injuries. Over the next four seasons, McGrady's game declined to a role player's level of contribution, and he missed 139 regular season games, and wouldn't get another true taste of playoff basketball. Eventually, in 2013, he was signed by the San Antonio Spurs and was activated just in time for the playoffs. He only saw roughly 25 total garbage time minutes in that postseason, and never scored a single point, as he was only a shell of what he once was. But technically, it did at least allow him to play beyond the first round of the playoffs, since the Spurs went all the way to the NBA Finals that season, before eventually being eliminated in seven games by the Big Three's Miami Heat. With that, he had played his final minutes of NBA basketball in only his early 30s. So as you can see, T-Mac had one of the most tragic and confusing legacies that the game has ever seen. 
Although legends like Kobe Bryant have praised him for being the most difficult player he's ever had to guard, T-Mac is also the star who couldn't advance in the playoffs no matter how many opportunities he was presented with. So what do you guys think? Was McGrady unable to advance in the playoffs simply because of all of the bad circumstances, like injuries and lacking supporting casts, or was there something about him as a player that kept him from getting it done? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Throughout the years, there have been hundreds of game-tying or game-winning buzzer beaters, and some of those were just a fingertip away from either not counting or counting. Now, we have the luxury of instant replay, so even baskets that are made as the clock expires can be reviewed to see if the ball left the player's hand in time. The thing is, the NBA didn't implement the instant replay until the 2002-2003 season, which means that in the entirety of league history leading up to that season, buzzer beaters were completely hinged upon the real-time judgment calls of the referees. And unfortunately, they didn't always get it right. In this video, I'm presenting five games where the referees had to make that judgment call and screwed it up. On January 15, 2001, the defending champion Los Angeles Lakers were in a regular season matchup with the lowly Vancouver Grizzlies. Shaq and Kobe were in their usual peak form as Shaq dominated offensively and on the boards, while Kobe put up a monstrous triple-double. The Lakers team defense had struggled throughout the night though, which resulted in this game coming down to the final possession. The Lakers had the ball with less than 10 seconds remaining and Vancouver was up by one point. Kobe finds an open Robert Ory, but he misses the shot by a mile. Notice how the clock freezes for a moment at 6 tenths of a second for some unknown reason. Shaq secures the board and puts it back in. But when we check the TV replay, it was clear that he released the shot way after time expired, even with the clock freezing for a moment. I remember watching this as a fan in real time, and even I felt like Shaq released the ball long after the buzzer. But somehow, the refs missed it and counted the basket. They also called a foul on Damon Jones, which clearly occurred as the clock was expiring. Shaq proceeded to miss the meaningless free throw, and the Lakers won the game despite the fact that they shouldn't have. On April 27, 2002, it's Game 3 of the first round of the playoffs, and the series is tied at one game apiece between Tracy McGrady and the Orlando Magic and Baron Davis and the Charlotte Hornets. Both superstars had monstrous performances, and heading into the final possession of regulation, the game was up for grabs. Seven tenths of a second is left on the clock, and Charlotte's PJ Brown is inbounding the ball. Davis loses McGrady for a moment, and is able to catch and heave up a prayer that goes in, and it appears to be the game winner. But as you can see, NBA referee Bernie Fryer begins calling off the basket basically as soon as it left Davis's hand. The Hornets team is irate, and for good reason, as it was one of the worst calls in NBA history. Not only did Davis clearly get the shot off, but as you can tell from this freeze frame, the ball was high within the air with as much as three tenths remaining. Due to this awful call, the game went to overtime. Fortunately, Charlotte still ended up winning the game, as this ended up being a major catalyst for the implementation of the instant replay starting the following season. It's November 20th, 2016, in a regular season matchup between the Toronto Raptors and the Sacramento Kings. Obviously, instant replay rules were in full effect at this point in history, but even with that being the case, I still believe the refs screwed this one up. There's only 2.4 seconds left, and Toronto needs a 3-point basket to tie the game and send it to overtime. The ball is inbounded to Terrence Ross, and it appears he clearly got the shot off in time, bearing the jumper and sending it to overtime. But after further review, the refs decided to wave the basket, giving the game to Sacramento. The logic of the refs was that the clock should have started as soon as DeMarcus Cousins deflected the basketball, which would have taken more time off the clock. The thing is, sure, maybe the clock didn't start right as Cousins touched it, but as you can see on this freeze frame, Ross hasn't even touched the basketball yet and the clock has started rolling, which means that in a sense, the clock did start because of Boogie's deflection. Not only that, but when Ross released the shot, there was still 5 or 6 tenths of a second left on the clock. So do we really know for sure that he didn't get the shot off in time? Again, the clock didn't start the instant Boogie touched it, but this is actually more common on buzzer beaters than you might think. For example, remember this iconic buzzer beater by Kobe Bryant to defeat Portland in 2004? Yeah, the clock didn't even start until Kobe had released the ball and the refs didn't take that one away. 
Bottom line, it was criminal to take this game from Toronto based on an egregious assumption by the referee. Back to the postseason now, it's the first round of the Eastern Conference playoffs, and it's the deciding fifth game between the Indiana Pacers and the New Jersey Nets. With a chance to ice the game, New Jersey's Richard Jefferson missed both of his free throws, which left the door open for the tremendously clutch Reggie Miller. Reggie hit a ridiculously difficult spinning three, keeping the Pacers' season alive. In this case, the referees counted the basket, but they shouldn't have, as the freeze frame clearly shows that the ball was still in Miller's hands as time was expiring. This shot, along with the shot Baron Davis made, both took place in the same playoff season, and it was clear then that the NBA had to do something about their lack of instant replay. It's March 5th, 2003, and a regular season matchup between the Indiana Pacers and the Los Angeles Lakers. After a hard-fought back-and-forth game with many highlights, the two teams find themselves tied at 95. The Lakers have the ball with 6.2 seconds left, and they have to take it from the backcourt. The Mamba is sprinting towards the three-point line when he's intentionally fouled by Indiana, who had a foul to give. Bryant hits the three-pointer through the contact and thinks that it's going to be a four-point play, but the referee waved it off, and everyone, including the Lakers commentators, thinks it's a horrible call. Take a listen. That should count. That is a terrible call. Kobe knew that they had a foul to give as soon as he dribbled into the front court. He gathered himself, went in the air and shot it. That is just a horrible call. I mean, this is continuation all the way. He stops, goes up, he gets grabbed. That is a basket. If they're going to re be able to look at the replays for the shots at the end of quarters, they better start looking at things that they mess up. I never understood the ref not counting this basket for Bryant, considering how Kobe took the shot as the foul was being committed. And of course, Kobe had every intention to shoot before the whistle because the clock was running out and he had no other choice. Fortunately for Los Angeles, Kobe wasn't the only clutch player on that Lakers squad, and flying in to save the day was big shot Bob, Robert Ory, who drilled this game-winning basket as time expired, which was extremely reminiscent of his iconic game-winning jumper over Sacramento in 2002. Ever since Michael Jordan shined in his NBA career, media and fans everywhere have been asking who would be the next Michael Jordan? Who would be the player who would rise above the rest of the league take the game to new heights, and win championship after championship as the new face of the league. Eventually, Kobe Bryant became the man who took the title, and the comparisons were constant. But before the torch had been passed to Kobe, there was another player who held the torch and was referred to as the next Michael Jordan more often than anyone else, Grant Henry Hill, drafted in 1994 by the Detroit Pistons. He was a lengthy 6'8 small forward who had all the skills, he could handle the ball, he could rebound, he could facilitate with the best of them, and he was an efficient scorer, and a force when driving to the rim. He was so good that in a 1996 interview, he received Jordan's seal of approval. MJ was asked in that interview who he sees as the next Michael Jordan, the guy he would pass the torch to when he does inevitably retire. Michael said two players, Grant Hill and Penny Hardaway. In Hill's 1994-1995 rookie campaign, he had an immediate impact and his revolutionary talent was clearly on display. For the year, Hill averaged a solid 19.9 points, 6.4 rebounds, 5 assists, and 1.8 steals on 47.7% shooting. When you compare these numbers to the rookie numbers of LeBron James, you can see what kind of impression this man was making upon entering the league. In the 1995-96 season, which was only his second season, Grant Hill led the league in all-star votes gaining more votes than even Michael Jordan. This was MJ, the greatest player of all time, in the middle of an MVP year and in the middle of his Bulls' historic 72-10 season. And yet Hill still received the most All-Star votes that year. That should tell you the level of potential that we as fans recognized in Hill during the mid-90s. During that sophomore season, Hill averaged 20.2 points, 9.8 rebounds, 6.9 assists, and 1.3 steals per game. The following year, he improved those numbers, averaging 21.4 points, 9 rebounds, 7.3 assists, and 1.8 steals per game on 49.6% shooting, while also leading the league in triple-doubles. 
And again, this was only his third season in the league. It was clear to everyone that this man was on a trajectory to be one of the greatest players of all time. At the end of that 1996-97 season, Hill had finished third overall in the MVP voting behind only Michael Jordan and Karl Malone. Hill was the first person since Larry Bird in the 80s to average over 20 points, over 9 rebounds, and over 7 assists in a season. That hadn't been done again until Russell Westbrook did it in the 2016-2017 season. As his career went on, Hill continued to dominate and lead his Pistons squad. Under his leadership and talent, the Pistons went from a terrible 20-win team to a 54-win team in just three seasons. By 1999, Hill was a respected force in the league and was carrying his Pistons. He had led his team in all three of these categories, points, rebounds, and assists in three seasons. The only other player in NBA history to lead his team in points, rebounds, and assists three times is Wilt Chamberlain. In the 1999-2000 season, Grant was having the best year of his career, averaging 25.8 points, 6.6 rebounds, and 5.2 assists on 49% shooting. He was only 27 years old and just starting to reach the prime of his career. And unfortunately, that's when it all came crashing down for Grant Hill. With only three games left in the regular season, Hill brutally sprained his ankle in an injury that would essentially ruin his days as an elite level player. His first six years in the league was one of the greatest starts to a career the NBA had ever seen, but he would never be the same after the injury. To give you even more evidence on just how special he was, after those first six seasons of his career before his ankle injury, he had a total of 9,393 points, 3,417 rebounds, and 2,720 assists. Oscar Robertson, Larry Bird, and LeBron James are the only three players in league history to eclipse these numbers after their first six seasons in the league. In the next six years of his career after his first ankle injury, he would have ongoing issues with the ankle and even had to have surgery. In those years, Hill missed a whopping 357 games out of a possible 492 games. He just couldn't stay on the floor. It wasn't until he was 35 years old in his 07-08 season that he finally regained his health and found a role on the Phoenix Suns. He was a decent role player for them, consistently averaging around 12 points a game, but his days as a superstar player were then just a distant memory. Essentially, Hill had only his first six years in the league to display his healthy talent before his progression was cut short and his career was basically ruined due to his ankle problems. To help put that in perspective, here are a few of the greatest players ever and the ramifications on their careers if they had a career-ruining ankle injury after their first six seasons. Kobe Bryant would have only three championships, no MVPs, and no 81-point game. LeBron James would have zero championships and only one MVP award. And Michael Jordan would have zero championships and only one MVP award. Hopefully this gives you a sense of just how much greatness we potentially lost from Hill. Due to this, he remains one of the greatest what-ifs in all of NBA history. Let me know in the comments section what you think Hill would have been able to accomplish if his health never betrayed him. Before we get into the video, I want to make a disclaimer. Obviously, it is impossible to know with complete certainty what kind of player Len Bias would have been. But I do think there's evidence that allows us to speculate, and that at the very least, we can make an educated guess on how good he would have been. So let's get into it. Len Kevin Bias most of you NBA fans are familiar with this young man's tragic story, but for those of you who are not, let me at least give you a quick recap. Bias was a 6'8 small forward slash power forward who played four years in college for the University of Maryland. Bias's game was filled with potential and he was one of the best players in all of college basketball as he was a two-time ACC Player of the Year. Bias was also famously known to have epic battles in college with Michael Jordan, as they often appeared as equals in terms of talent and performance, or at least very close to it. Bias was a highly coveted prospect heading into the 1986 NBA Draft. Meanwhile in the NBA, Magic Johnson's Lakers and Larry Bird's Celtics were the premier teams in the league. The Celtics went on to win the 1986 NBA Championship, led by their stars Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish. That 86 Celtics team is still considered to this day as one of the greatest teams of all time. 
Fast forward to the NBA draft, and thanks to a trade a couple years earlier with the Seattle Supersonics, the Boston Celtics owned the second overall pick in the draft the same year they won the championship. Cleveland had the first overall pick and needed a big man, so they selected the future all-star center Brad Doherty. So with the second pick, the Boston Celtics selected their exciting forward of the future, Len Bias. Adding a future Hall of Famer to the all-time great and defending champion Celtics team appeared to be a solidifying factor in continuing this Boston dynasty. But then, less than 48 hours later, while he was at his college dorm room celebrating with his friends, Len Bias had a seizure and collapsed. Soon after medical attention arrived, it was confirmed that Bias had passed away at the age of 22. It was simply a coke overdose, making Len Bias the poster child of the NBA's terrible drug issues in the 1980s. Naturally, this tragedy has gone on to make Len Bias arguably the greatest what if in NBA history. So now that we're all informed, let's get into the meat of this video. First off, let's talk about Bias's skills and establish what defined his game and what made him such a unique talent. As I mentioned earlier, Bias was a 6'8 wing who could switch between the 3 or 4 spot on the court. He was lean, but very muscular. As a 22 year old, he hadn't fully grown into his man body yet, but he still appeared as if he was ready to bully grown men in the post once he hit the NBA. He was incredibly athletic with a remarkably high vertical leap, especially considering his size. Maybe his best quality was his beautiful beautiful and smooth mid-range jump shot. With his solid footwork, tall stature, long arms, and high two-foot leap, his jump shots were extremely tough to contest. He was very efficient from the field as well, shooting about 54% over the course of his college career. He wasn't much of a playmaker or a facilitator, but his two great gifts were essentially his scoring and rebounding. These are the key aspects of his game that I want us to pay attention to. I spent a lot of time thinking about other players in basketball history who were similar to Bias in terms of their stature, strength, athleticism, position, their skill set, and even their numbers in college. Here's a few names I came up with. Dominique Wilkins, Larry Johnson, and Xavier McDaniel. Now let me make this clear before I continue. I think Bias would have been better than all of these guys, even Dominique, as great as he was. But what I'm doing is trying to get a basis to work from, looking at their college and pro statistics to give us kind of a general idea in what kind of a player we might be getting in Bias. All of these guys had varying degrees of great athleticism and strength just like Bias. They were all pretty good scorers who had an offensive style similar to Bias as well. Take a look at the numbers from each of these stars from their last season in college. They all clearly had high expectations too, based on the fact that they were all top 4 picks in the draft. Notice their high scoring and rebounding numbers and also their lack of assists. Again, this is showing their similar tendencies. All of these players went on to be all-stars in the NBA, although Dominique was clearly on another level from the other two. In my opinion, Xavier McDaniel and Larry Johnson was Len Bias's floor. There's no way he wouldn't have been as good as these two players in the NBA, although like I said before, I think he likely would have been much better than both of them. The most comparable career I think he would have had would have been to Dominique Wilkins. Both great leapers, similar footwork, same height, same hot spots on the court, and so on. Remember how I said Bias had epic scoring battles with Michael Jordan in college while they played for Maryland and North Carolina? Well you know who had epic scoring battles in the pros with Jordan? Dominique Wilkins. This is what I envision for Bias as a pro, like Dominique 2.0 on the offensive side of the ball, averaging 26 to 32 points per game in the prime of his career while accumulating 8 to 10 rebounds a game. But I said he would be better than Dominique, but that wasn't because of the offensive side of the court, but the defensive side. Bias showed incredible potential in college with his defensive prowess. He could frustrate players, cause turnovers, had a tremendous wingspan, and was a terrific shot blocker, often blocking shots you would think would be out of his reach. Dominique didn't have that on the defensive end, not even close. Another thing about the solo duels in college between Bias and Jordan. Bias had arguably greater numbers in college than Jordan did, and based on their talent and what we saw from them on the floor, he appeared every bit as ready for the pros as Jordan did. And how ready was Jordan? Well, let's put it this way. In Michael's rookie year, he took the NBA by storm, averaging 28.5 points per game, 6 rebounds, and 6 assists on 51% shooting. 
If MJ is any indication, then Bias would have had a significant impact immediately upon entering the league. Which brings me to my next point. Bias was joining the fantastic Boston Celtics. The year he would have been a rookie, the Celtics went on to the NBA Finals where they lost in six games to the Los Angeles Lakers. If Bias was as good as I'm projecting him to be, then I can't possibly see how he wouldn't have been the difference in that series and helped the Celtics win their second straight championship. Keep in mind, Larry Bird was the starting small forward and Mikhail was the starting power forward, so the plan likely would have been to bring Bias off the bench. But with Larry dealing with ongoing back problems and with Mikhail trying to push through the playoffs with a broken foot, there would have been plenty of minutes available for Bias to shine as a star and make his impact. In an interview with Bill Simmons, Larry said that if Bias had lived, he would have retired in 1988, meaning the passing of the torch would have happened very quickly between Bias and Bird. It's likely then that Jordan and Bias would have gone on to have many epic battles through the years in the Eastern Conference playoffs. One thing I'm almost sure of is that by the end of Bias' career, we wouldn't have seen him as just another one of those star players that Jordan kept from winning championships. Because like I said, I think the Celtics would have won the championship in his 1987 rookie season. So in recap, how good do I think Bias would have been? Well essentially, Dominique on offense with a hint of Larry Johnson and Sean Kemp, and significantly better than all of those guys on defense. Add on at least one championship ring, but maybe even a few if things went right. It's also important to keep in mind that he passed away from a coke overdose. If coke had continued to be an issue for him, it's possible that it could have screwed up his career even if he had lived. That has in fact happened with other great players in the NBA's history. But again, this is just my educated guess on the player he would have been. Let me know your educated guesses in the comments section. For nine seasons of basketball history, the ABA, known as the American Basketball Association, was a competitor to the NBA until the two leagues merged in 1976. During its lifespan, the ABA had around 10 teams in its league. Before the ABA had merged with the NBA, it was a league known for its free-flowing style, its small ball lineups, and it was actually the league that first introduced the three-point shot, which many people in the NBA thought was too gimmicky for a while. Many people in the basketball community, including viewers in my own comment sections, have been debating how the ABA stacked up against the NBA from a competition standpoint during that era. I would certainly love to hear some perspectives from people who are old enough to have witnessed those leagues, so if that's you, please let me know your thoughts in the comment section. The thing is, the NBA all-time lists do not recognize the achievements of the ABA, so all of their points, Rebounds, MVPs, championships, and so on don't count towards the player's overall resume, and therefore alters where many great players could rank on the all-time lists. This has been especially devastating to all-time great players who spent time in both the ABA and the NBA. So what if we took into account everything that took place in the ABA as well, whose legacies would be impacted the most? I've evaluated many careers of NBA players, and these are the ones that really stand out. First off, Moses Malone. If you've been following my channel for some time, then you've probably heard me say that Moses Malone is the most underrated center in NBA history, but I've been saying this simply based on what he accomplished in his NBA career. If you include his ABA seasons, he becomes even more impressive. These are the stats and accolades he was able to stack up in the totality of his career of both the NBA and the ABA. With his two ABA seasons included, he goes from 5th on the all-time rebounds list to 3rd overall, only behind Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. Something that many fans don't know about Moses Malone is that he's easily the greatest offensive rebounder in basketball history. He was an absolute beast when it came to battling for position, securing the boards, and giving his team second chance opportunities. On the NBA's all-time offensive rebounds list, Moses Malone is the history's leader, and no one else is even remotely close. If you include his seasons with the ABA, that gap gets even more dramatic. To even further emphasize how ridiculously dominant he was on the offensive boards, consider this comparison. Kevin Garnett and Moses Malone, both big men who played 21 seasons in their basketball career, and Garnett actually played in 7 more games than Moses did. KG is one of the greatest rebounders of all time, and at one point, he won four straight rebounding titles. Yet as impressive as KG was at getting rebounds, Moses has well over twice as many offensive rebounds in his career than Garnett did. If that doesn't tell you how unparalleled Moses was on the offensive boards, then absolutely nothing will. The next player we're looking at is the six-foot point guard Louis Dampier, who played three seasons in the NBA with the San Antonio Spurs, but he played his eight best seasons before that in the ABA with Kentucky. Louis was a great three-point shooter, and when I say great, 
I mean he was elite even by today's standards. He shot 35.8% from three-point distance over the course of his career, which is good, but the volume is the stunning part. During his prime in 1969, he was shooting 7.1 three-point attempts per game. This is how unique his volume of threes was in that era. In that same season that he averaged 7.1 attempts per game, the league average for an entire team was 5.9 per game. On an individual level, that many attempts would rank him in the top 20 players in today's NBA. If you want to talk about a player who was ahead of his time, there isn't many better examples than Louis, as it was common for him to spot up in the corner for a three, even on a two-on-one fast break. In 1969, he made 199 three-pointers over the course of the season, and then followed it up by making 198 in 1970. It took nearly three decades for someone in all of basketball to eclipse that total. He averaged as high as 26 points per game in 1970, and by the end of his ABA career, he was the league's all-time leading scorer with nearly 14,000 points. Many of you have never even heard of this guy before this video, but if ABA achievements counted, many of you would know him as one of the pioneer shooters of the game and as one of the great players of basketball history. Next up is Spencer Haywood. Given enough time and almost every star eventually becomes underrated, but this is definitely a major case for Haywood. His NBA career saw him play with several teams, including the Sonics, the Knicks, and the Lakers. The 6'8 power forward only played one season in the ABA, which was his rookie season, but what a debut season it was. He was an incredibly talented and graceful big man who had fantastic dribbling skills and would often score in spurts with his solid mid-range shooting. In his debut season, he averaged 30 points and 19.5 rebounds on 49.3% shooting. Despite it being only his rookie year, he led the league in points, rebounds, and minutes while playing all 84 games in that regular season. He also led his Denver Rockets to a 51-33 record and was named that season's MVP at only the age of 20. If ABA achievements were acknowledged, then this rookie campaign would be on the short list of the greatest rookie seasons of basketball history. Guys like Dan Issel, Connie Hawkins, and Jimmy Jones also significantly improved their legacies. One of the biggest impacts would be how we see the man known as Dr. J, Julius Irving. The doctor had a lot to his game, as the 6'7 small forward was one of the most athletically gifted players the league has ever seen. His unique style, flair, and dominance have led many old school basketball fans to refer to him as the Michael Jordan before there was Michael Jordan. If you want a breakdown of his impact and greatness, then you can watch my How Good Was Julius Irving video. It's no question that the doctor was one of the greatest basketball players to ever live, but if you include his dominant years in the ABA, he now legitimately enters the GOAT conversation, as his championships, his MVPs, his all-star selections, his all-team selections, and even his scoring titles dramatically increase. He also skyrockets from 72nd on the all-time scoring list to the 8th spot overall, putting himself ahead of legends like Moses Malone, Shaquille O'Neal, and Akeem Olajuwon. Many people don't know this, but he was also a dominant rebounder and one of the greatest at his position, especially in his days in the ABA. With all this being said, it's understandable to an extent why the NBA almost never acknowledges the achievements of players from a former league that they were once competing with. There's also the question of competition and the strength of the leagues to consider. So here's my question to you guys. Do you think the ABA stats and accolades should count on the all-time lists? Should they be treated as the same as all the other stats of the NBA's history? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Today, I'm bringing you a story about a player that very few basketball fans know about, and in the time he played the game, he was one of the greatest basketball players to ever live. His life would become one of the most tragic tales of basketball history, but also one of the most heartwarming stories about life and friendship that you'll ever hear. Let's get into it. Maurice Stokes was born near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1933. He was a loved and highly respected individual amongst his friends and peers, and that theme would continue into his NBA career. Maurice had remarkable God-given athleticism at a very young age. He played college ball at St. Francis University and quickly became one of the most highly coveted prospects in the NBA draft. In 1955, at the age of 22, he was taken with the second overall pick by the Rochester Royals. He was a 6'7", 232-pound power forward, who was freakishly quick, 
athletic, strong, and was remarkably skilled with a basketball, and he was able to put all of those abilities on display as soon as he hit the floor. As a big man, he would regularly grab the rebound and take it coast to coast on his own, which certainly wasn't a common thing in that era. When we envision a modern athlete going in a time machine and playing against the less athletic competition of the 50s, that's what Marie Stokes looked like out there on the court. The competition simply couldn't handle him as he took full advantage of the disparity in the athleticism. Maurice was also a very intelligent basketball player who had incredible court vision. Due to this, he was a remarkable distributor, especially for a big in the 1950s, which was basically unheard of during that era. Honestly, the best comparison I can make to his build and skill set is that Maurice Stokes was the LeBron James of the 1950s. The rookie was taking the league by storm. In his very first NBA game, he dominated the New York Knicks in all aspects, as he dropped 32 points, snagged 20 rebounds, and dished out 8 assists on a deadly 61% shooting. In each of his first four games in the NBA, he secured 20 rebounds. His abilities as a scorer, rebounder, and facilitator made him one of the greatest triple-double threats in league history. At one point, he recorded a triple-double in four consecutive games, which is a feat that only seven other players have accomplished in NBA history. Just one month after his incredible debut game, he had another impressive showing against the title-contending Boston Celtics, where he dropped 31 points, 27 rebounds, and 6 assists, leading his Royals to a one-point victory. Just a month after that, he lit up the defending champion Syracuse Nationals, producing one of the greatest performances by a rookie that sports has ever seen. On the night, he dropped 26 points, 38 rebounds, and 12 assists on 61% shooting. And thanks to this Herculean effort, his Royals upset the defending champion Nationals with a final score of 102-93. At the end of his debut season, he was awarded the league's Rookie of the Year and even got an MVP vote. That debut season, he averaged 16.8 points, 16.3 rebounds, and 4.9 assists as he firmly established himself as one of the best players in the game. He was the league leader in rebounds already in his rookie season. This individual dominance continued into his second and third season in the league. He was selected as an NBA All-Star in all three of those seasons, and he earned an NBA All-Selections all three of those seasons as well. In his third year, he was second overall in rebounds and third overall in assists. The only other player who's ever accomplished that feat was the legendary Wilt Chamberlain. I need to emphasize, he wasn't just a good rebounder, but at the mere height of 6 foot 7 inches tall, he was one of the few greatest rebounders of all time. For his career, he had the third highest rebounding average in NBA history at 17.3 per game, which trails only the great Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell. Thanks to his efforts in his third season, he was making his first trip to the NBA playoffs. Unfortunately, it was the only playoff series that he would ever participate in. On March 12th, in the last regular season game of 1958, on a drive to the basket, Maurice leaped high into the air and went over the back of the opponent and landed directly on his head. For a while, he was unconscious. Eventually, he was able to regain consciousness with smelling salts. Despite the horrific fall, he returned to the game and finished the contest with 24 points and 19 rebounds in a 7-point victory over the Lakers. Three days later was his first NBA playoff game, and little did he know that it was the last game of his NBA career. On the night, he scored 12 points and snagged 15 rebounds in a loss to the Detroit Pistons. After the game, the Royals went on their flight back to Cincinnati for Game 2 of the series. During the flight, Maurice suddenly collapsed and began to have a seizure. All of his teammates were obviously extremely concerned. As soon as the flight landed in Cincinnati, an ambulance picked him up and rushed him to the hospital. After being in a coma for about a day, Stokes eventually woke up when he discovered that he was completely paralyzed, only able to use his brain and look around with his eyes. Obviously, this was due to the brain damage caused by his fall several nights earlier. Of course, this completely changed Marie Stokes' life, 
as he not only lost function of movement, but there was now tremendous medical bills to pay that he couldn't afford. Maurice didn't have much of a support system and didn't have very many loved ones to take care of him. This was something that deeply affected his teammates emotionally. One of those teammates throughout all three of his years in the NBA was the small forward and his dear friend, Jack Twyman, who was the only teammate who lived near Stokes. Jack was only 23 years old at this point and had recently got married and started his own family. After speaking with his wife about the matter, they came to a major decision. Out of love and compassion for his teammate, Jack decided to become a caretaker and the legal guardian of Maurice, accepting all financial responsibility and all responsibilities for his well-being. Jack was now there to support his teammate and his friend, as Stokes fought hard to recover some of his physical abilities. Maurice took that same positive energy and determination that he had on the court and channeled that into his recovery process. Through all of this, their bond and their friendship grew tremendously as the two leaned upon each other for support. Slowly, Maurice started to regain tiny bits of functionality in his body. In June of 1969, over a decade after Maurice's paralyzing fall, Jack Twyman was contacted by St. Francis College, which was Maurice's college university. They told Jack that they had built a new beautiful gymnasium and wanted to honor their former star player by naming the gym the Maurice Stokes Fieldhouse. As a surprise for Maurice's birthday, Jack and his family held an event where the president and athletic director of the college announced the name of the gym to Maurice, who was unaware of the decision up until that point. When he was made aware of this, a grateful Stokes wept tremendously. Back then, NBA players didn't make nearly the kind of money that they do today, so even a star player like Jack Twyman needed financial aid to support Maurice. A man by the name of Milton Kutcher was a business owner of a country club in upstate New York, and was a massive basketball fan. Milton was aware of the situation between Maurice Stokes and Jack Twyman. Milton Kutcher reached out to Jack Twyman and suggested that the country club hosted a basketball game to raise funds for Maurice's medical bills. Milton said that he would cover all of the expenses for the event. All Jack had to do was recruit the players. The event only needed 10 players for the game to commence, but thanks to Stokes for being such a beloved person within the league, roughly 75 of the NBA's best players showed up to the event at their own expense, including guys like Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell, and Dolph Shays. For years, this event continued on annually, with many greats consistently making appearances, like Wilt, Oscar Robertson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Willis Reed, and Pete Maravich, just to name a few. After some time, once some of his physical abilities just slightly returned to him, Maurice was even able to attend his own event, and experience once again the love that the league had for him. Eventually, on April 6, 1970, Maurice Stokes passed away from a heart attack at the young age of 36. After his passing, the event continued on in the form of a basketball charity game for many years afterwards, carrying on his legacy and touching the lives of many after him. As you can see throughout this story, not only was Stokes a powerful force within the league with his basketball skills, but he was also a powerful force in the hearts of many, as his story is one of perseverance and friendship. In terms of basketball, Jack Twyman is on record saying that if the accident never happened, considering how the Royals acquired Oscar Robertson shortly afterwards, he believes the Royals would have been the dynasty of the 60s rather than the Celtics. That we can never know for sure, but what we do know is that the short time that Stokes was out there on the court, he was one of the best players to ever lace him up. After the Bulls won their sixth championship ring in 1998, the team imploded, due to turmoil between the general manager, the coaches, and the players. Most basketball fans know the details about why this team disbanded, and if you watched the Last Dance documentary that released a few years ago, then you certainly know all about it. But if you don't know the details, you can watch my summarized version with this video. Now towards the end of that documentary, Michael Jordan talked about how frustrated he was that his Bulls didn't get a chance to win a seventh championship ring in 1999. Phil Jackson retired due to pressure from general manager Jerry Krause. 
Without Phil Jackson around, Jordan decided to retire from basketball. Without Jordan around, Bulls management determined that they couldn't compete for championships. So they traded Scottie Pippen and Steve Kerr, and they released Dennis Rodman. Jordan was convinced that if Phil Jackson hadn't been pushed out of his coaching position, that entire squad would have returned for a chance to compete for a seventh ring in 1999, and he believed they likely would have won another championship. But is he right? Would the Bulls have won a fourth straight title to close out their dynasty on an even more legendary note? Well, I actually believe this answer is a bit more complicated than people usually recognize. There's a lot of nuance to this hypothetical question, and although there is absolutely no way we can get a definitive answer to something that never happened, at the very least, I can make an educated guess based on the information in front of us. So without further ado, let's get into it. The first thing we have to do is look at the state of the Chicago Bulls team at the end of the 1998 season. We'll start with Michael Jordan. MJ was 35 years old and had just finished his 13th season in the NBA. Jordan would have turned 36 during the 1998 to 1999 regular season. Now in those 98 finals against Utah, Jordan was extremely tired as he had just led the Bulls to their third straight deep postseason run. Although MJ was quickly approaching his late 30s, he believed he was at his very peak of his basketball abilities, at least from the perspective of his basketball IQ, and in his ability to execute what he wanted. Regardless of the fact that it was his final season in Chicago, he was the league MVP, he was the league's leading scorer, he was first team all defense, he was the all-star game MVP, and he was the finals MVP. So in a sense, MJ might have been correct about this being his peak. Now Michael Jordan was certainly exhausted at the end of these NBA Finals. But that wasn't just because he was much older at this point in his career, but it had a lot to do with the fact that he had to take on a greater load throughout that season than usual. Scottie Pippen was recovering from surgery throughout the 1998 regular season, which meant that Jordan had to play more minutes and utilize more energy in order to win 60 basketball games. In those NBA Finals, Scottie Pippen was dealing with back pain, which caused MJ to have to carry the Bulls team offensively to an even greater extent, as he averaged 33 of the Bulls' 88 points in that final series. So although MJ was understandably very exhausted, I don't see that as an indication that he didn't have much left in the tank for 1999, but rather, I saw that as a symptom of his extremely unique situation throughout the 1998 regular season. In my opinion, Jordan would have been his usual dominant self in the 1999 season, and was certainly up to the task of winning a seventh ring. So now let's look at Scottie Pippen. Obviously, Scotty was mostly a shell of his usual self towards the end of the Bulls' championship run, as his brutal back pain caused him to act as a decoy in Game 6 of those NBA Finals. With that being said, Scotty's health recovered almost completely in time for the 1998-99 season. The biggest piece of evidence for that statement is the fact that Scotty didn't miss a single game for the Rockets throughout the entirety of his 98-99 season. But it is worth mentioning that Pippen looked as if he had lost a small step due to his increasing age as he averaged nearly 5 points per game less with the Rockets, and his efficiency from the field took a bit of a dip as well. His Rockets only made it to the first round of the playoffs where they were eliminated by Shaq and Kobe's Lakers. In that postseason, Scotty was quite inconsistent. For example, in Game 2, he completely disappeared scoring only 3 points on 0 of 7 shooting in 37 minutes of action. But in the very next game, he put up a career performance, dropping 37 points, 13 rebounds, and 4 assists, while playing all 48 minutes in a blowout victory. So at the very least, Scotty was extremely streaky at this point in his career, but to a certain extent, that was always an aspect of his game throughout his playing days. In conclusion, Pippen would have definitely lost a step in 1999 and wouldn't have been as much of a sure thing as Michael Jordan. Now let's look at Dennis Rodman. Of the Bulls' three-headed monster, Rodman was the oldest player, and if the Bulls were to make it all the way to the NBA Finals in 1999, Rodman would have been 38 years old before that series even started. Generally speaking, players in the 90s didn't age as gracefully as they do today, especially a guy like Rodman, who leaned heavily upon his strength, quickness, and athleticism. 
Of the three stars, his decline in basketball skills was certainly the most evident. Some people forget this, but he was losing some of his edge even in the 1998 postseason. In that final series against Utah, Rodman played more than 30 minutes in only two out of the six games. Along with that, in only two out of those six games did he reach double-digit rebounds. This decline was not only evident in his level of production, but it was also evident to Phil Jackson, which is why he was significantly decreasing his minutes. Just like Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman actually played in the 1998-1999 season for another team, as Dennis was a member of the Los Angeles Lakers. The thing is, it's really difficult to gauge what player Rodman would have been on the Bulls in 1999 based on what he was for the Lakers that season. To put it simply, Rodman's stint in Los Angeles was a nightmarish roller coaster. They won their first 10 games straight with Dennis in the purple and gold, but once he became a disruption in the locker room, things became dysfunctional soon after that. Rodman was saying that he needed vacation time in Vegas while claiming that Kobe and Shaq were jealous of his luxurious lifestyle. Kobe and the rest of the organization were questioning his commitment to the team, and Shaq is on record for saying that Rodman was the worst teammate that he's ever had. After Rodman had missed yet another Lakers practice, LA's management became fed up with his antics and released the star forward just as the playoffs were set to begin. Now here's the thing. Kurt Rambis was filling in as the Lakers interim head coach and was completely unqualified to handle all of these egos. With the psychologically brilliant Phil Jackson as the head coach and with Michael Jordan and Scotty as familiar teammates, I don't see Rodman having these same issues with the Bulls in 1999. In conclusion, the Bulls would have had a productive Rodman in 1999 but he would have certainly been a significant step slower and less productive than the team was accustomed to. So now that we've looked at the Bulls' three stars, let's dive into the details of the 98-99 basketball season as a whole. What people often forget is that the 98-99 basketball season was a lockout-shortened season, where only 50 regular season games were played compared to the usual 82. Now at first glance, you would think that a shortened season would actually work as an advantage to an older Chicago Bulls team, who could greatly benefit from more nights off. I honestly don't think that could be farther from the truth. The key detail here is that because of the lockout, regular season basketball games didn't start until February 5th, 1999 which is roughly four months later than when basketball season usually starts. Due to this, the NBA schedule was way more brutal than ever before, as each team had to play 50 games in just 90 days. Instead of just back-to-backs, in many cases, teams had to play games on three straight nights. This was a brutal schedule for everyone, but for a very old team like the Bulls, who had just played basketball for three long championship seasons, this highly condensed season would have been especially draining. Now before you completely write off the Bulls for the unfavorable schedule, consider this. The strength of the competition certainly wasn't as formidable in the Eastern Conference compared to years past. Patrick Ewing had an ongoing Achilles injury that forced him to sit out in the playoffs. Shaquille O'Neal had left Orlando for Los Angeles several years earlier, and the top-seeded Miami Heat were shockingly eliminated in the first round by the eighth-seeded New York Knicks. Eventually, it was that eighth-seeded Knicks who made it to the finals out of the East, even though they were without arguably their best player, Patrick Ewing. Simply put, the Eastern Conference was wide open for the Bulls' taking, and even if the Chicago group wasn't as good as any of their six previous championship teams, I still believe they would have been good enough to get through a relatively weak Eastern Conference on their way to the NBA Finals. The thing is, waiting for them in the Finals would have been the extremely formidable San Antonio Spurs. Now it is worth mentioning that the Spurs and Michael Jordan's Bulls faced off twice in the 1998 regular season. And although both games were very close, Chicago won both matchups. San Antonio was even better in 1999 though, as they had lost only one game throughout the Western Conference playoffs on their way to the finals. Along with that, San Antonio was extremely strong where the Bulls were weak, in the painted area. The twin tower combination of Tim Duncan and David Robinson would have had the size to give the Bulls nightmares. 
And if it wasn't the 6'7 Rodman trying to slow them down, it would have been some big like Bill Wennington, who would be on his knees praying for mercy. San Antonio was also the number one ranked defense throughout the 1999 season, and by no small margin either, as they were consistently allowing the fewest points in the paint. I understand Jordan never lost in the NBA Finals before, but this would have been his greatest test yet, as Rodman was on reduced minutes, and an already tired Bulls team had just got through the most grueling schedule they've ever experienced. When you consider how Pippen lost a step, Rodman lost a step, and the favorable matchups in the paint for San Antonio, I see the Spurs winning this series in six or seven games. Now again, it's Michael Jordan in the finals, so maybe he ultimately finds a way to get it done. I think it's unlikely, but who knows? Maybe someone would have personally offended him before the series, in which case all bets would be off. There have been numerous instances in NBA history where the league or a player within the league got the fans' hopes up with something they said or promised, but unfortunately, those hopes never became a reality. Here's my five biggest instances where the NBA let the fans down. Number five, LeBron James's dunk contest promise. LeBron James is one of the most powerful and ferocious dunkers that the league has ever seen. His incredible athleticism and his astonishing ability to finish above the rim haven't just been displayed in actual basketball games, but he's even been known for putting on a show during warm-ups as well. This has resulted in LeBron being one of the most desired participants for the dunk contest, ever since he started playing professionally in 2003. Well, in 2009, the NBA was especially struggling to create interest for the NBA's dunk contest and was desperate to relive the glory days, where some of the greatest players in the world competed. So in the middle of the 2009 dunk contest, Cheryl Miller interviewed LeBron and asked him point blank if he was planning on participating in the dunk contest the following season. And LeBron said the following, Right now, I'm preliminary putting my name in the 2010 yeah, yeah. dunk that's contest right. on Saturday night. Right. LeBron James is saying that's that in 2010 that's right. in that's Dallas right. Stadium, that's right. primarily I put my name in the dunk okay. contest. Right. Obviously, LeBron did not actually go on to participate in 2010, which was disappointing in and of itself. But what made it worse was how terrible the 2010 dunk contest ended up being as the Lakers' Shannon Brown was a huge disappointment and no one really stole the show besides him. The funny thing is, he could still make it right and put on a show in the dunk contest if he really wanted to. Number 4. Wilt Chamberlain vs. Muhammad Ali in the Boxing Ring You guys have heard me talk about plenty of crazy things concerning Wilt Chamberlain, but one of the craziest is how he nearly fought the greatest in the sport of boxing, Muhammad Ali. It all started on Howard Cassell's show in 1967 when Wilt challenged Ali to a fight, but it wouldn't gain serious momentum until a few years later. Even at a time when media wasn't nearly what it is today, there was a ton of coverage about this possible fight, as both potential competitors were doing a tremendous amount of trash talking leading up to the event, which was scheduled to be at Madison Square Garden. Although Wilt would be out of his element, he did certainly have the physical advantages, as he was 7 foot 1 inches tall, weighing about 275 pounds, and he had a 92 inch reach. Compared to Ali, who was 6 foot 3 inches tall, weighed about 210 pounds, and had a 78 inch reach. When asked for a prediction on the fight, Ali responded with just one word. Timbo! <laughs> Will Chamberlain agreed to fight Muhammad Ali for a total of $500,000 after taxes. But when the time came to sign the papers and make it official, the contract said that Chamberlain would be getting $500,000 before taxes. Wilt, being upset about this, decided to decline the fight. Ali was insistent upon making it work, so he said he would equally split the purse of $1.5 million with Chamberlain. But Wilt refused that too. Even though Wilt made the challenge, Ali was definitely more insistent on making the fight happen. But at the end of the day, Wilt decided that it wasn't enough money to make it worth the time and the effort. Let me know in the comments who you think would have won the fight and in what fashion. Number 3. Shaquille O'Neal vs. Hakeem Olajuwon in a televised game of one-on-one -on -one. In 1995, Shaq and Hakeem were at the center of the debate for the title of the best big man in the entire NBA. But Hakeem basically squashed that debate as soon as the NBA Finals were played in June. 
It was between Shaq's magic and Akeem's rockets, but it was hardly a contest as the rockets swept the magic in just four games. Although both centers played extremely well and each put up strong numbers, it was clear which big man had firmly established himself as the man on top of the basketball world. This narrative didn't sit very well with the Diesel, who said he believed that he was still the better big man. So Shaq sent this letter to Elijah Wan, challenging him to a game of one-on-one, -on -one to settle the score once and for all. Hakeem actually accepted the challenge, and hype began to swirl around the basketball world. This was such an anticipated and expected event that there was even television ads to promote the showdown. Unfortunately, Hakeem Olajuwon injured his back leading up to the event, and the matchup had to be cancelled just a day before they were set to square off. Shaq was later asked in an interview if he thought Hakeem was just looking for an excuse to back out, but Shaq had too much respect for the dream and said that he didn't believe that was the case. Let me know in the comments who you think would have won in that one-on-one -on -one scenario. Number 2. The Chris Paul Trade to the Lakers I won't talk about this one too much because I have quite a bit in recent videos, but when the trade went down in the winter of 2011, basketball fans only had about an hour and a half to anticipate a Chris Paul and Kobe Bryant tandem before news broke that the league office had blocked the trade. Obviously, the biggest disappointment for basketball fans as a whole was how it ruined the chances of a Kobe Bryant vs LeBron James NBA Finals, which is one of the most unfortunate realities of NBA history without question. Number 1. The NBA claiming that it would crack down on flopping and then doing basically nothing. A lot of people wouldn't consider this one to be anywhere close to the top spot, but what you need to understand about me is that I absolutely hate flopping. As an old school basketball fan, I see flopping as a constant reminder of how much the league has softened since the golden days when I first started watching the game. I don't really blame the players though, since flopping does give them a competitive edge. It gets the other team in foul trouble, it can make a regular foul look like a flagrant, and in the cases of guys like James Harden, it can earn you a lot of easy extra points at the free throw line. It's not like guys didn't flop back in the day, because trust me, guys like Vladi Divac and Danny Ainge were frequent floppers, which is a big reason why I didn't like either of them. But throughout the years, it's only become worse and worse as it's now a regularly practiced strategy on a widespread level. It got bad enough that in 2012, the NBA established that it would be fining its players for flopping. The rule stated that any player who flops during a regular season would first be warned followed by fines in increments of $5,000 for each successful flop during the season. I remember when this announcement first happened, and I, along with many other basketball fans, was beyond thrilled, thinking that this would be the move to eradicate this pathetic acting out of the league. Well, the problem is, the league has since painfully under-enforced the rule. In the past 10 seasons of the rule being established, there have only been a total of 31 fines given to the players. Despite his reputation, Chris Paul has never been fined, James Harden and LeBron James have been fined only once, and in the last two seasons of the NBA as a whole, there have been zero fines distributed to all of the players. And a lot of these flops that I've been showing on screen took place in the last two seasons. So again, it's not mainly the player's fault, but the league office for refusing to enforce the rules like they're serious about it. One can only imagine how much better the league would be today if the league office actually grew a spine and enforced the rules like they meant it. So now it's your turn. Which one of these scenarios would you have liked to see play out? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always. Make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.